Welcome to the Self Poor Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Allsweed. Today on the pod, Grammy nominee for Song of the Year, co writer of Despacito. He's done videos with Snoop Dogg. He's written platinum records for Jason Derulo, Enrique Iglesias, G Easy. I, I, I don't know. There's a lot. He's done a lot. He's done okay for himself. You may know him from his groups. Scapegoat Wax and One Block Radius. I know him as a pretty good friend. This was a great conversation. We talk about the beginning stages of his music career. And it starts young. It's really fascinating. We only get so far. We basically get to about the the beginning of his kind of a, a more popular career when he signed with the Beastie Boys record label Grand Royale. So there's going to have to be a part two. There's going to have to be. He just so happens to be launching his very first independent record label. It's called Mighty Oak Records. It's uh, focused on basically the areas of California outside of of Los Angeles and the Bay. Uh, He has a really interesting perspective and vision. Here is singer, songwriter, producer, Mr. Marty James. Welcome. Thanks, Welcome. man. Thanks for having me. Marty James. I really like what you guys are doing here at the Commons and with the podcast and everything. It's family, so you know I had to tap in. I mean, you have a lot of new, exciting stuff going on, so it's a good timing. It's a good it's timing. really good timing. It's crazy how that works. It's like when you <laughs> put good energy, good things happen. Um, we, uh, we're going to go into your past at first. Uh, okay. The light to dark wall that we have here. That's, mm-hmm. that's, we, we start with the light beer or dark beer and go into the past. Um, Usually the people I'm gonna be talking to is like people I don't know, which is which is nice. You, right. You you you're a friend. I kinda know yeah, you a little bit. You know me very well. Very well. That said, there's plenty about you that I don't there's know. There's definitely probably <laughs> more that you don't know, a lot more, but you are my friend. A um, close friend. Thank you, thank you. Uh so your past, you where let's go like before where you were born. Where where did your parents meet? They my parents they met in Dixon okay. in high school. My mom had me when she was 15 and my dad was 18 and they got married. That was a different time. So I'm very grateful to my mom that I actually was born, Seriously. all things considered. Um, yeah, so my mom is actually from Sacramento. She comes from a Mexican family. My dad uh, is just a, a nice Euro white guy from Dixon, from a, a very more conservative uh, family. And you know they got together young. I had a bunch of kids early, but um, Dixon, California was actually my home um, till I was about 10 before we moved here. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, my whole family's kind of like still in that area, Solano County. And um, <clears throat> my dad got uh, caught on with Cal Water up here. He got a better job. So my parents got divorced and my dad moved to Chico. And for a couple of years, I stayed in Dixon because I was already in school. I was in like third grade, second, third grade. Mm-hmm. And um and uh, my, my, my dad moved up here, and eventually my family, you know, it was just time for me to move with my dad. I, I tried to stick around with my family as long as I, my grandma actually got cancer at uh, 43, my mom's mom, and mm-hmm. passed away. I was really close with her, so she was kind of like my oh, mom. I didn't know that. Uh, so she died very young. And I was trying to like stay down there to like be in the mix with my whole family. But eventually it was just time for me to come up to Chico. So my brothers, my brother and sister were actually here for a couple of years before me. So I moved to Chico when I was about 10 and I started going to Ten. Rosedale. Mm-hmm. So you have like super vivid memories of, of like when your grandma. For sure. Oh there. man. Yeah. I mean, uh, she was a very, I mean, she was a young grandma. I actually have an uncle that's younger than me. That's how young my family's having. <laughs> I have an uncle who's five months younger than me. So my mom love- and her mom were actually pregnant at the same time. So I have an uncle wow. who's like my brother and then my grandma was like my mom. And uh, yeah, she's just fighting off cancer. And in hindsight, I think it was probably like Johnson and Johnson, like baby powder. She was like one of those things, which we won't even get into, but they okay. have a big a bunch of lawsuits. Oh. Yeah. And we feel like she's wow. probably part of that whole thing. Cause John, you know, baby powder used to be so prevalent back then. And I feel like that probably had something to do with it. Cause we don't actually have that running in our yeah. family. No one else has had, it was ovarian so yeah there's a lot of layers to that story but i mean basically yeah she fought it off for a long time and i definitely had vivid memories i mean in a weird way that happened 
and it was such a deep effect on me. I just remember being like the probably the most sad I've ever been in my life. At that time, I was like just a fragile kid. My parents were divorced. My mom was kind of going through some things. My dad had moved, but I was like, I'm still very, very close with my family. And my mom, I met my grandma. Um, you know, she she was a, a fighter, and I just remember being so devastated. But in some weird ways. I'm almost grateful for that experience because it put such a heavy weight on me at such a young age that other things didn't seem that serious. Like when I was trying in the music industry and I would face huh. rejection and it kind of put a little bit of armor around me. Like, well, if I already got through this, like who cares what these people think about? You know what I mean? There was, well, there was that's, a certain that's amount definitely... of shield around me that was like, well, it's not going to be as bad as that. And so a lot of times in life, you know, you kind of got to look at things with perspective and just be like, okay, this is, this is not how ideal how I wanted it, but things can be a lot worse. And so from that point, I sort of just move forward and I've, I've kind of tried to turn that really dark thing into like a blessing in a way because I know my grandma would have wanted that. She she was very encouraging of just kind of, you know, make, you know, like things that grandmas do, you know, they make you feel special, they make you feel important. And she kind of just gave me a, a, a confidence about me to just go for it. And so in a weird way, it kind of became like a blessing. It kind of became my identity in my mind a little bit. Like I can, I can handle this. I can handle everything. I was the big brother, you know, I had going through some family stuff yeah. and uh, basically, you know, I moved to Chico and you know, kind of didn't know anybody. I remember walking into Rosedale, like first day of fifth grade. I was like Miami Dolphin. Up. Fifth grade. Yeah, fifth grade. I moved to Rosedale. Uh huh. I moved That's to Chico. That's a super pivotal time yeah. to leave. To dude, New it was City, it was dude. weird because I yeah. was like, you know, at school I was already ingrained. I was playing basketball third and fourth grade. I had all these friends, and I mean, I pretty much left most of what I knew there. And it was good to be with Brad and Aaron again, my brother and sister, mm -hmm. and see my dad and. My grandma was just about to pass away when I moved to Chico. And after I lived here for a couple months, we lived in Pine Tree Apartments. I remember getting the news. We lived in Pine Tree Apartments for the first few years. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of friends there, though. That's the cool thing about oh, apartment place, complexes is like- There needs to be a documentary about yeah, like, that there was so I made so many friends immediately as soon as yeah. I moved there that Chico instantly welcomed me. Like I made friends at Rosedale. I didn't, I didn't go through some period where like I didn't have any people. Like Chico immediately welcomed me, my family, and, and just living in Pine Tree. Like kids just playing ball together. We were outside all the time. This is pre-smartphones, well, everything. Well, look where we are right now. Byron yeah. exactly. grew up yeah, in Pine I Tree. Know, exactly. Exactly. I, know Byron, I, met Byron, I met Byron back then, the Caparellos, Jamie Smith, Chris Smith. We all lived in Pine Tree. The halls. That there, there's the halls. some mm -hmm. yeah, we, phenomenal uh, athletes and talent totally. in that place, dude. Yeah. It's, and right. it all, it was, it's a, it's a low-income it apartment, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Which it, is I awesome. I mean, at the really time, impressive. I mean, low-income by Chico standards. It was still pretty nice, you know, right, right, right. projects or nothing. But, I mean, it was definitely, it was definitely a breeding ground for just, like, Personalities. We were outside <laughs> personalities. We were so outside. There's no smartphones. There's no internet. You know what I mean? Like we were oh, truly yeah. back in the day. And but um, there was a lot of big brother, little brothers. For sure, happening. it was weird. Like Rob and Jamie. We we're all like we had the big brother, little brother, all over you the know, place, crew yeah. happening. And uh, yeah, so then we, we we eventually, you know, my dad moved up in the company and he bought a house over off West Sac and, and Hollybrook and then that we kind of continued on from there. But yeah, it was a big change and I immediately like you know just took to chico and it was funny because those relationships those friend relationships 11 12 is kind of like when i started making music actually in the fifth grade class i started my teacher mrs forrester would like let 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 me kind of like get up in class and perform because i would like tell stories or i just do basically a stand-up bit or like i'd write a little song and a little rap about the song and like every couple Amazing. fridays every now and then she'd be like okay marty's gonna do a little That's story awesome. time just or something. you though yeah just me and i would just be up there winging it. i was such a ham you know and uh and it was it was a good it, i mean it gave me a lot of confidence people seemed to react to what i was doing so it, from that point fifth sixth grade is like yeah. when i actually started making songs and it started in Chico. But that's not just making songs. That's performing, too. I was performing. There's a lot yeah. of, like, introverted, talented people that just sit in their room making music. Like, that That was a different kind of... That's kinda... true. Yeah, I was kind of like that, though. Even in third grade, yeah. second grade, I was always kind of, you know, trying to make everybody laugh and have fun and kind of cut the tension a little bit, probably to a fault at some times if they got older, <laughs> goofing around too much. But, I mean... Yeah, I started to, that's when, that was the beginning of me kind of being like, yo, I actually want to make music and I want to perform and, and do all that. And yeah, I mean, so, that's kind of yeah. where the journey began of the music stuff, you know? And, and yeah, I want to get kind of a little more detailed on, on the, the beginning too. But uh, first, a couple of things. Uh, 
grandma there's just something about grandmas it's like they're yeah. just they're the best thing in your life my my, my totally. passed away when i was in i was in sarajevo and i was like 21 but it whether i was 10 or 21 like it still hits you the same way it's just like I it, it changes so it changes pure. your life I've even seen my parents become grandparents. They change. Yeah. Their dynamic changes yeah. between how they treat their kids and how they treat their grandkids. I'm like, yo, where was all this love? <laughs> Death. Well, because it's always like, angry at us. Now they come around. No, but it's just all the good it's stuff. It's funny how it just it, it it's a shift, and you see it with your parents, <laughs> um, and it just feels different. You have a different view of your grandparents that just becomes. They, there's a, a, a level removed where it's just like we're gonna spoil you and take care yeah, of you and the be stuff. the be the the safety net. So yeah, but they, just, they 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 definitely influence who who we are to as people. Um, well, they're wise. They yeah. have life. You know, a right. lot of times our parents are growing up. They're struggling. They're figuring it out too. Right. They're more like mentors. Our yeah, parents they're were like, almost fighting our parents. They've already through that. Yeah. So they're like, yo, okay, we know your parents are a little hectic right now, but you know, we're here for you as a deeper support system. You um, know? Yeah, I, I will say though, like as we get older, like in our thirties and forties, and like you start to like just the concept of therapy and figuring out like why the the why we're messed up and the ways we're messed up. Uh -huh. It's usually all comes down to trauma in those early yeah. ages. So like, like it's cool that you kind of flipped it to where it it made you stronger, but undoubtedly that stuff like oh, traumatizes sure. us, Definitely. and then and it you... causes our like you know. I think I have a drinking problem or yeah, whatever. Like it's for sure. It, it's weird. It kind of like you, those those sort of things is it. You start to figure out like where do I crave attention? Why do I do this? Right, this right. Why do I? Why why am I a nervous eater? Why when something <laughs> you know? I mean, I guess all of these things. I mean, part of them are human nature, but a lot of it's you know your upbringing. What are you surrounded by? What are you? What 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 makes you tick? What makes you kind of go off the rails? You know. Yeah. Um, the, the, that, this is the stuff that we have to figure out in our it's the the stuff 40s that you and have 30s. To figure it out, but as long as you can, you know, admit that there's stuff you have to figure out, I think it will, you know, right. you can come to terms with some of that stuff. I think when you kind of deny it, you kind of don't want to deal with it in a lot of ways, but when you start to, you can find, you know, a little deeper happiness, a little more calming okay. peace, a little more of a calming voice, deeper breath, things where you are like, you know, I'm actually okay and I don't need to like, use crutches as much as right. I used to and I can actually get through this you know on my own without you know uh relying on alcohol or drugs or whatever right. it is but yeah man I mean this area in particular you know I mean we all kind of <laughs> it's not you know this all of northern California region you know it's a hard working region it's a blue it's a blue collar area and I always tell people when I travel the world to write songs people hear you're from California. Oh, and everyone thinks it's just the beach and Surfing. the palm trees, mm -hmm. and and they don't really realize how much of it is a blue collar, very you know working environment. And I think that that creates you know a lot of passion. It creates a lot of soul, but it can also create you know a lot of desperation in some ways. Mm -hmm. With people, you know, they they get they're early and on in their life, and they might be in a bad situation, and it can kind of if you don't really tackle it, it can kind of get the best of you. I mean, we've lost right. a lot of friends along the way yeah. who have, you know, just not been able to get it under control. And so, um, it's well said. I think that, you know, um, growing up is, is very, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a process that I think as you get older, you realize that it's never over until it's truly over. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm maturing more every day. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the, the people, the really truly wise people are constantly learning, even when they're, mm -hmm. you know, on their deathbed, they're yeah. still kind of taking stuff in. And, and I think that that's kind of how I want to be, you know, I feel like I used to be a little more of a know it all. And even at times right. I catch myself, you know, wanting to just give my opinion on everything. And, um, I think as you get older, you kind of like, you want to take a little more mental note and you want to, hear other people's opinions and see other i mean really everybody has their own experience you know and 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 i think that people's opinions about life and about how they move through different things it's all rooted in you know how you were brought up how you look at things so i think i try to see a little more validity in everybody else. you know when i'm so stubborn and hard-headed when i was starting out you couldn't tell me anything you know and <laughs> And I didn't want to collaborate. I wanted to produce all my own records and start to collaborate. All of a sudden, my records got better. And all of a sudden, my music's getting out there more. So, you know, a lot of it is just learning. You but know? That, that, that's, in your case, that's a real kind of business decision, too. For like, sure, yeah. And for any, for any artist, 
you come to that point where you're like, you always want to be your own artist, make your own music, have your own face behind your music. But then uh-huh. it's like, and I mean, you, you can speak on that as well as anybody. You got to make that transition. For sure. I mean, to collaborating where am I gonna with write people for other on people? their records, but then also me collaborating with producers, writers yeah. on my stuff. I remember when I was making Okie Blow, the first Scapegoat album, I, I, I wanted to produce a majority and then they, they got Eric Valentine to come and produce some songs and he did Space to Share and Perfect Silence, like two of the best songs. The productions are insane. Yeah. I learned so much just by sitting in those sessions and I realized how much my songs could benefit from hearing yeah. you know, somebody else touch them, somebody else add their two cents. I mean, this guy's you know genius, genius guy. But uh, I mean, um, you know, that was the first time I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I get this collaborative thing now. It's really, it's about making the songs the best that they can, not just yeah. about this is mine, you know, for me. It's so, also a totally natural step that you have to take when you're an uh, artist. Like, you're obviously you're going to feel that way at the beginning where... Yeah. But, um, but so... So anyway. Last thing, last thing before uh, we get into music. Um, what, so... I'm curious about the kind of the Mexico connection. Like, yeah. have you? Do you know? So, your grandparents were born there. You know, my my grand my grandpa is Grandpa from, Joe. Grandpa Joe. My mom's mom is from a a small town in like somewhere south of like El Paso area in Texas. Okay. Like he's from West Southern Texas. That's uh, Juarez. It's yeah, it's around that area, but it's in Texas still. It's like. Yeah, I mean, well, there's not I, the only thing south of El Paso. As far as. Yeah, yeah. Um, my grandpa's from originally that area, and okay. then he moved to Sacramento. So I believe they're kind of like second, third generation, maybe oh, from okay. Mexico. So my grandpa still, you know, speaks, you know, fluent Spanish. It's funny, like my great grandma on that side. I mean, we before she passed, it was full on Spanish yeah. in the house and everything. So it's I feel cool. that kind of. The wave in California, whether people say it or not, is that you kind of move to California with trying to become more Californian. Yeah. You know, and all of my mother's family, they married, you know, Anglo fam. They married, you know, all white people, basically. (laughs) So um, there wasn't Spanish going on, per se, not in my immediate family. But in my grandparents' family, there was. So I definitely feel i felt cultured like we in my mind it was like part of my family is very mexican and part of my family is very not mexican and very white and kind of more you know typical small town kind of you know um conservative so it was kind of cool because i felt like get i was you know in the time i didn't know but it it was more of like a cultural experience plus more of just kind of a down home vibe you know and then i mean it's no coincidence that you i mean for your music was not spanish at all no for your uh-uh. first what 10 15 years that you were making yeah, it no it and wasn't. then you had this pretty significant yeah it evolution was working with enrique iglesias that really kind well, what of what about like to that point but what yeah. about bash and like bash beforehand? too bash bash too it's yeah bash is a good point baby actually. bash yeah. to, be, to be clear bash uh-huh baby bash um but bash isn't a big spanish speaker either we <laughs> yeah. were doing a lot of stuff um i i had actually it's funny like it, it's weird how much i sort of at that time i was working with a lot of texas groups too like frankie j and paula deanda paul wall paul wall for sure um but yeah there was sort of uh i guess i guess i always kind of had had i mean that that kind of started with with texas you're right because that was before latin speak the the spanish speaking music that i became more involved with was definitely more with the miami scene and the enrique scene it started in 2012 the, the the years before that a lot all the stuff i was doing with bash and really it was you know i was working with mexican artists but it was more rooted in sort of you know pop and r&b you know? what was the we're just i, I was going to try to go chronologically here but we'll just hop all over but um, i mean i could go a little more chronologically <laughs> it's a, no it's cool yeah. this is great uh i mean and since, i mean i have a lot of memories of all this stuff too so it's just a lot of stuff yeah. comes back um the uh what was I remember the the Paul Wall record with uh-huh. I grind was I it grind, that yeah. was like oh uh-huh. eight I want to say was, uh, probably oh eight oh nine because I think it was after OBR. Did you do a Bash record before that? All I remember is Fantasy Girl. Was there? Uh, I actually have a bunch of random songs with Bash. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, there's the uh... how the hell that I even get? It? I mean, I've known Bash. Well, let me just give you how I even got to this point. <laughs> okay. So we're in, now I'm in Chico. And I, I love doing music, and I met some buddies at Chico Jr., my buddy Maurice, my friend Ray, and we kind of like just formed this little group where Maurice would beatbox, and he was very into, he would show me all the cool stuff, the Source magazine, and we, were, we started to get really tapped into like what was happening in hip-hop scene through magazines and stuff. So this is like 
the late this 80s this is like the late 80s dude this is probably <laughs> like 89 90 yeah something like that and uh this is like hip-hop's golden era just starting yeah so we we're just we becoming were just popular eating all that up and um and it started off as just kind of like in my bedroom is like beatboxing and i was like man how do they make this music this is so dope and so i immediately talked my mom into getting me like a four track and then somehow i came up on some janky mic and all of a sudden like i was making music in my room at like 12 on a cassette four track with like a casio mpc i mean casio uh, sk1 or whatever it was called mm -hmm. and i would try to emulate dre and all these guys and figure out like how are they sampling but i was doing it the old school way where like i would have i mean there were so many different um versions of how i was making janky bedroom records first it was like boom box to boom box press and record on <laughs> one playing the music on the other one <laughs> and just like recording myself <laughs> yeah. live from the music and that was the one then we got the four track that was like blowing my mind. I'm like, wait a second. I could put the music on this one, then my voice on this one. So everything was just like this eye-opening experience. And um, so it started to get deeper and we started to make records. And I, I really wanted to figure out how they would make, you know, the track sound so good and take, you know, Marvin Gaye samples. And I would hear them just mix stuff together. And I had no idea. So I was recording on these little janky samplers, putting the mic up to the speaker, sampling them. and. And I really couldn't figure it out, but around 13, I started going to studios. I started going to studios in town. There was one called Starshine Audio, and they honestly didn't really know how to do it either. Like then, they, they were like still jam band studios, tape, reel to reel, everything yeah. was through the mixing board. They actually were giving me some wrong advice, telling me like, oh, you need a synchronizer, and that's gonna, and I'm like asking, going to the music stores here, do you guys sell synchronizers? And they didn't even know what I was talking about. I was talking about sequencers, you know? Um, <laughs> So, so I kept recording, I kept making, I, I started, I started making my own songs and I really got hyped up. Like I was, you know, at Chico Jr. rapping for everybody, telling everybody like, yo, we're doing this. We have a group. I performed in a talent show in ninth grade. You know, that was like my first big show. Me and Maurice came out and we had like matching outfits on and we did like a whole rap and, <laughs> and the crowd was like really oh into God, it. Oh my God, there's like, no video? This is there's crazy. no video? There is a video. Oh yeah. Yeah, there is a video somewhere. <laughs> um, and like Maurice gets mad and like throws the microphone because it didn't work. So it was just a little bit of crazy drama, but you know, junior high. So, and, but like the response was the like response genuinely was people liked oh, people it. People were going crazy. Like, I mean, I, I remember thinking like, whoa, this is crazy. I couldn't believe how much people <laughs> liked it. Cause I'm like, this is really isn't that good. I remember thinking like, we're okay, yeah. but like we're well, getting a lot. So what it just makes me think of is like, obviously you can't help but think of the technology today. Right. And how easy it is to make a song uh, and what that means for the the volume of it. Yeah. So part of it is just like, who else is doing this? Yeah. You At know, that like, time, there wasn't really any music. Yeah. I, I mean, there was a guy called Diz Money from Chico that everyone would say, oh, <laughs> you should meet Diz Money. His name was Chris. I never even met the guy. But I think he <laughs> left Chico like right before I got there because then people would say, oh, you got to talk to Diz Money because he had put out a tape. His tape was at Sundance. So to me, back in the day, tapes and CDs was just mm. like, yo, I mean, this was when Sundance was downtown, Tower mm. Records was downtown, the warehouse was over there. This was when record stores existed. It was, they were all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Camelot was in the mall. I mean, they, yeah. it was like popping. And so to have your tape in a store, no matter where you were from, that yeah. was just so dope to me. And this guy's tape is in Sundance. I'm like, yo, I gotta have something. I, I wanna get my stuff out there, you know? I mean, I remember even, I remember thinking like, because I was more like a, you know, they're like a wannabe in a way. Like, oh, it would be great if I was a musician, like, without yeah. doing anything about it. But just the thought of having a tape in a store was like, it's yeah, impossible. Yeah, it, it was so cool So you me. must have, like, you're, like, getting this area. Like, did it ever, did it seem, like, impossible right away? Or just seemed possible um, no, right away? No, it didn't seem impossible yeah. to me because I just didn't think about it if it was possible or not. I was so driven and I just loved it so much that I would spend just... I would come home from school, from not even paying attention to school because I was thinking about music so much, mm -hmm. to just to just wanting to record. I wanted a tape so bad to be out. So I said, I'm gonna make my own tape. And I made this whack ass song. My first tape was called Running Like a Hardcore Criminal. And, and some people will know it. It's an awesome but title. <laughs> it was the title of the album. I mean, title of the song. And I was rapping about hardcore running from the criminal. police, running like a hardcore criminal. Well, I was like 12. In, you were influenced based by NWA I was and Two exactly, Crew. I wanted to be NWA and so I, I did this little whack beat off the Casio. I dumped the whole thing into the st the studio session. So at this point, 
I was just like saving up whatever money I could and I would get like four hours at Starshine Audio and I would go in there as like 13 year old and I would just d- dump it in to the, okay, here's my Casio beat play and I would record it on the tape and then I went into the booth and recorded. And then at that time they were, they were cutting a deal. I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna buy a hundred tapes. You guys label them. So my first actual cassette tape has a white label. We were on Bump Town Records. That was my first <laughs> label. The group was like, what was a group? <laughs> Too Smooth or something like that. Running like a hardcore criminal. I had 200 oh tapes. My God. Yeah, and I was like, okay, now I got my own tape. What am I gonna do with it? And pretty much didn't know what to do with it. So I started just going around with Maurice and the guys who were like in my crew. When we go to Chico State and we try to sell a tape for like two dollars, and normally we just end up giving them away. Yeah, I think I probably got rid of maybe like thirty. There was like, ten, you know, fifty left in my room after. But it kind of like got me excited enough to go like, wow, I actually just made a song and made a tape, and um. From then, you know, I realized, okay, I'm going to have to figure out how to actually make this music sound right because it's not sounding right coming off the Casio, going into this. Like, sonically, it was just sounding weird still. I was getting frustrated because I'm like, how do I get my music sounding like this NWA record? Why am I, what am I missing? And like I was saying, the the studios here really weren't equipped for what I was trying to do, Mm -hmm. you know. But I think that's what, like, differentiated you and a lot of successful people from everyone else is like I think a lot of people in that situation are like just so satisfied with what they've done and that's yeah. it you're just like instantly not satisfied with the sound for instance like that that's the beginning of the the excellence right yeah totally I think I was just like yo this is not right like I want it to sonically sound like Ice Cube and right now it's just sounding like even though I, I thought oh when I go to the bigger studio that's how it's gonna sound right and right. then I'm like actually it's this Casio it's all this reverb on my voice it's that the samples I'm using are just wrong. And so I started to like 13, 14, I was still kind of doing the same thing, making these sort of like half-ass sort of whatever they were, just composite songs from the bedroom. And I was like, okay, there's gotta be like a deeper level to this. So I was hanging out at the record stores all the time, you know, Melody, I I would would love to just see what that, I just love the environment of the music magazines and just all the music stuff happening in those places. So we would just go, I would go to the record store like every day, sometimes to look at old records, sometimes to look at the new stuff. I was just obsessed with it. And there was a BAM magazine, Bay Area magazine, and it was in all the towers, tower records, you know, Mm -hmm. at the time. And so I uh, grabbed one and I just started looking and I got to the back of the one ads and there was just all these advertisements for studios in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Basically advertising, you know, we got top notch quality recording, Pro Tool, I mean, not Pro Tools, it was Cakewalk, Cubase, advertising that we're recording on the computer. The Bay Area started to get it popping with so, the actual like way a, that, you, yeah. So the PC wasn't even really a, it was hardly a thing at that it point. It really wasn't that prevalent. Like and that, it, that's it wasn't like in everybody's house. It wasn't no. like people were making music on computer yet. I hadn't right. seen that before. So I found this one studio called Jam Studios and it was 15 bucks an hour, which was actually like yeah. cheaper than it was in Chico. And I was like, 15 bucks an hour? sounds like a pretty good deal so i call the guy start chopping it up with them he can kind of tell that i'm young but we work out a deal and i had saved up about two or three hundred bucks i booked a whole day with them and i drove down to the bay and i brought all of the by this time i'm like i was going through vinyl and i really became obsessed with music and so i just had all these ideas i was like i want to take this piano from sly and the family stone and put it with these drums but i didn't know how to do it so the guy kind of told me like get some samples together when you come down we'll put some stuff in the computer you can tell me what you're thinking and i'll show you i'm like okay this sounds fucking crazy right so i shoot down i think i was by myself the first time my dad uh i think my dad drove me to the bay or somehow i got down to the bay i I wasn't old enough to drive yet and I spent the whole day down there in this, I walk into the studio in San Francisco. I, 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 I've been to San Francisco hundreds of times. I still get turned around in the city. I don't even yeah. know where I'm at half the time. But at the time, I go to this studio. It is an underground of this house. And I was just like so excited to be like, whoa, this is gonna be a game changer for me. I knew right off the bat, like if I could figure out how to record actual music, I'm gonna do something in this because I'm so driven. And I remember I got to this house and then we went under his house to this studio and it was so dope. And I just remember like, okay, this is gonna be my new home. Yeah. And he had real, he had like two, he had, he had a eighth inch or like a half inch tape of the eight track, but he had all these out, these synths. And then he had a computer 
and a record player. And so I started saying, okay, I wanna take this piano from Dr. John and put it with this drum break. And, the, and Mark Shahada, who became one of my mentors, he was just like, put it together in seconds. And it was like, the drum break was in and the piano was on and I was like, that's exactly how I heard it. <laughs> and I was like, can you put this guitar? And he just sampled that and he would tune it. And then all of a sudden this like stab guitar. Cause at this point now I'm listening to Cypress Hill. I'm listening to, you know, House of Pain. I was obsessed with DJ Muggs and, and Dre. And I wanted to sound like all these LA producers. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I'm like, yo, this sound quality is it. Like it was, I could be like, yo, you can play my songs back to back and you're not like a major drop off. So then I had, when I was showing up, I had three full songs written. I already knew what I wanted to do. I had the, all the verses. I was doing like 20 bar verses with some little hook. And I, I really was like, I did three songs in one day. So I would come back with that new music. Every, so basically for the next two years, I just honed my craft doing that. I would go down and see him, uh -huh. I'd save up birthday money, whatever, I got my driver's license. And so for about two years, I was making a demo every six months. I'd go down to San Francisco and I would have the same exact plot. Like I want to take this guitar, put it with this, whatever I was influenced by, you know, I would, mm -hmm. I would throw it together hodgepodge and I would always leave with like three, four songs that sounded way better than anything else I was doing. Is he coaching you vocally? He's coaching me vocally, okay. fully showed me how to really truly produce and produce a record and just bang shit out quick, you know? Wow. And so that, then I'm like, okay, now I'm back in Chico. What do I do with this? And this is back in the day when you could look at a record and see addresses fan clubs, managers, lawyers, record labels. Yeah. So dude, I just went into full on, I'm sending this to everybody that I can. And I would go buy all these envelopes, all these, and I'll duplicate the tape. I'd put my name, I'd put information about me and I would just try to find a name because that's what people would say. You couldn't send unsolicited material to labels. So you would have to know somebody, but I would just send okay. it anyway. And I would send it to production companies, managers. I'm 15, you know, 16, sending these out. Following up, acting like a lawyer at 15 or saying, hey, I sent a package. Could you, did you t happen to get it? <laughs> Most didn't, but that's actually how I got into the game. You know, just sending them out, cold calling people saying, hey, I sent it, did you get it? And, um, and some of it, you know, some people, I remember just people taking my call and giving me feedback and I'm like, okay, this is, this is kind of working. Like people are not just writing me off. Some people wouldn't take yeah. my call, but a lot of people would take my call and they could see like, after a minute they get to know me, they'd be like, this kid's pretty passionate, you know? And so um, where did, yeah. where did that come from? What, Dude, just the I fact don't know. that you were so yeah. like, you were like a kind of a perfectionist, right? Or like you at least had this ambition, like, yeah. I, I, dude, you know, at the time, I didn't even think about it like yeah, that. I yeah. just thought, yo, this is it's what I have normal. to do. Now when I look back, I'm kind of like, yo, I work with kids. I'm, I mentor kids. You know, I have nieces and nephews. And yeah, that type of drive at that age, I think I was just so hellbent on figuring out how music would sound better. Like I was yeah. almost challenged. Like, and, and, and honestly, all the feedback I was getting was like positive. Like I right. have to be honest, like no one was telling me like, you suck, give right. it up. Like people right. are like, huh, this is actually not bad. Like you're 14, 15, 16. Were you making... singing already? The, the thing is, is at first I was just rapping. Then I wanted to be like Cypress Hill. So I started rapping in this crazy voice like this. So <laughs> I really was rapping in like these different voices. But then when it would come to the chorus, I would try to do a sing songy melodic kind of thing that you would remember on these initial records yeah kind of yeah. like i would come up with a rap hook but then as i started listening to zoom that just dance hand on the pump that right. fell on the 40 i'm like Ooh. oh okay i remember that you know what i could add a little melody to this and my i don't even know what the notes are or what i'm singing but right. if i just sing songy something on the hook that actually is going to be more memorable than just me just saying a line and then going into scratching, which was well, a big part of like hip hop hooks then. You just, right. yeah, here we are. But still though, I think you know? now like when I listen back on some records from the early 90s, it's like, oh wait, there was a lot more singing going on in this rap. Kind of started, like, and that's what they're got just like kind of, it's not Whitney Houston, but it's just like, yeah, there's some melodies. For sure, and that was really influential to me. So like, I, I, I started kind of adding melody, you know, to, to things because I thought, okay, this is gonna make it more of like a proper hook. But sending out the music, the way that things started to change up was, I did that for a couple years. The first demos were, you know, it started to get progressively better, you know, and even the people that I was sending it to would start to say, yeah, this one's better than the last one. Keep sending me the stuff. A lot of the people were encouraging me like, Who you know were what? These were A&Rs? So it, it was partly like just, 
labels, like I'm indie labels. Who's answering, like who's, yeah, it's indie like somebody labels in the office, got, like there's a kid. I, I would call and say, hey, if I'm sending a package, who can I send it to? And yeah, they would yeah, say, oh, send it to so-and-so. And then so I'd put attention, I'd ask for that person. So some of them are just like labels, A&Rs, managers, but the one that changed up everything, there was actually two that changed up everything. I did a very savvy move when I was young. It's funny that <laughs> I even thought to do this, but I actually got a couple, as I started to kind of go more into the Cypress Hill realm, mm -hmm. that, that was such a hot sound that I actually started, to, I was like 16, I was, I was 17, I was really getting a little better. I was like, everything was just getting a little more concise. And I started to get more of a nibble, I'll say. It wasn't just like, hey, you're good. Keep on sending it. Aw, shucks. It was like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. So I had two nibbles, per se. One was from a guy called Schoolboy who was at Buzz Tone Management in L.A. They managed Cypress Hill, House of Pain, Rage Against the Machine. Wow. And I sent it to a guy there, and he's like, yo, I got your package. I actually like this. Uh, what's up with you? And I'm like uh yeah i'm not like i'm trying to act like i was older than i was he's like um yeah hit me back next week and we'll talk more so i'm like oh this guy did you get did you get scared as hell i got kind of like <laughs> excited because yeah. i'm like well if this guy likes it maybe there's something there and one of the other people who was hitting me back was johnny z who actually became mm -hmm. like my mentor mentor and he had into deep at the time out of vallejo and those guys i idolized those guys i had their tape before it, they had even got their deal with profile i had their four song demo my uncle had given it to me he's like yo these guys are out of vallejo fairfield area listen to this song and it was back to the hotel they had made it on, on their demo which and I was that's like, like 91 92 yeah like 92 and that song was a, I mean, that song was a hit. It's a classic. Yeah. I still hear that song. And so I immediately love them. They were two white guys too, yeah. you know, and I thought, man, and actually JT is part Mexican. So I just, everything about them, I'm like, yo, I, I, I got to like try to get down with these guys. And in their demo, it was Johnny Z, Rated Z Records, 710 Marine Street, Vallejo. Here's our phone right. number. So I started sending him stuff in the mix. Mm -hmm. And he was always cool. He was picking up the phone. Sent, he was one of the main ones who was like, you know what? I hear some potential. Keep sending me stuff. So I would always follow, follow up with him. So by the time I sent him like my fourth demo, I got the hit back from Buzz Tone. And then Johnny heard the new one. And I'm like, what do you think? He's like, I really like it. I go, well, yo, uh, Buzz Tone is like really interested in me. And he's like, oh, I could see him perk up, right? So I kind of like told Buzz Tone, oh, yeah, this other company yeah. in the Bay is interested no, in me. Yeah, perfect. So Buzz Tone flies <laughs> me to L.A. Wow. When I'm like six, I was 17, yeah, probably wait, just. And also, first of yeah. all, what am you, I even you, doing you, at this point? Like, I'm like, went, would you let your 15 year old go to some basement in, in San Francisco to record? Like, I know, by it's themselves? weird. Yeah. It's well, just crazy how it, different times are. Yeah. And also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the funny part is, is my, my family it's like they weren't super, that was normal back then, yeah they, but even then they like my dad was like you know my parents were divorced i was helping take care of my yeah. brother and sister every day there was nobody telling me like don't do this and there was nobody telling me do this so i was kind of like which is there, actually kind of good yeah it's kind of good kinda i was kind of left on my own vice yeah. and like you figure it out with you, what you want to do because some families are like no you're not gonna i mean how many people probably try to make beats at some point and their family's like uh no you're going to right, right, uh, right. college just like everybody else or how many other people have been pushed and like, you're gonna really. do this and they don't really want so i was kind of in a weird way it was like i could kind of do whatever I wanted because of just the way my life was set up. Yeah, you grew up fast. I grew uh, up fast. By the way, did you did you 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 uh, left high school right at some point? I I actually like took my proficiency exam, but I would still like show up at high school and like do my songs and like try to win people <laughs> over. Yeah. So at that well, point, now they have Inspired. It's like a whole division they dedicated have that. to music. I was the Inspired yeah. department at that point. <laughs> They don't. Ha they didn't have that when I was young. They definitely didn't have that. Like I was tuned out at school. Um, yeah. But you know, in you'd show up yeah, just to I would show up and just be like, "Yo, here's my new song, everybody." <laughs> oh, hey, if I was a teacher, I would let you in every yeah, time. Yeah, and like I actually think that they were probably like no one ever told me no. Really, yeah. I mean, they were like, "Okay, he's doing this thing." I'm, and so I um. So when you fly down to L.A. Yeah, I fly down to L.A., I get there, and I think... Where is this? Is this in Hollywood? This is in Hollywood, West Hollywood, and I'm like at Buzz Tone Management, like my dream company, and I'm like, do not belong there. Like, I was not ready, <laughs> and amazing. I think they call me in for the meeting, and it was like Happy Walters. It's like huge, I mean, it a huge executive All these names are amazing, too, yeah. by the way. And so I'm like, and they look at me Happy when I walk Walters. in, and they're like, okay, cool, all right. They talk to me for a minute, and then I go back out, and I sit there and he's like, okay, we're gonna take off. And so we go back. And so this guy from Buzz Tone, he like shows me around. He takes me to Everlast's house. 
at the time. Everlast is like my idol. He's like, oh, we're going to go pick up Eric's passport because we're, we're going on tour. So we pull up to Everlast's house. He's in there playing Madden. And I sit down. I start playing Madden with, with Everlast. And I'm like, dude, how am I in Everlast's apartment playing Madden right now? By the way, you, you're the person that only introduced me to moments like that where I was like, whether it was like Nipsey or whatever. I was yeah. like, what am I doing here? Yeah. I mean, dude, I, I was, that's like the first time and I was a kid and I remember thinking like, is this really happening? And so I asked the guy, I said, well, what did they say? And he goes, well, you know, they think they're, they think you're very young and you're a little green, yeah. but they want to kind of see you progress. And so I'm like, okay, that's kind of a no yeah. right now. And I was, I was not ready. Like I was just this chubby kind of, 15 like 16 frumpy kid wearing fresh jive like i was not prepared like they they had the biggest acts in the world so they're like okay his music sounds good but this kid is not put he's not ready yet you know and and and, and it's not like even though it was early in, in in that genre like there were still plenty of people who looked like you whether it was for sure uh everlast or um uh what's what's what are the people from new york uh um, they had like a, a rap show on MTV. Oh, third base. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, oh, they were my idols too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. anything from that era was just like, I wanted to be like those guys. So what do I do with that information? I report back to Johnny Z in the Bay and I tell him, dude, Buzz Tone's about to sign me. They just flew me down. And he immediately goes, you know what? Grab your records. Come down this weekend. We'll do a couple sessions this weekend. That's amazing. And I, I, that, that I'm very thankful for because I, I, for some reason, I just had that little edge about me that was like, yo, I'm going to manipulate the situation to, to yeah. work in my favor because I'm working my ass off. The other interesting thing, too, is like even like with all these like steps forward, it's still like you, you have there's so many steps that need yeah. to happen. Yeah. Like. There's, I mean, there's always red tape. There still is red tape. There's like, all these different like things. People think, like, like a lot of people would think, oh, if I'm getting flown down to L.A., like, I made it. Yeah. Not at all. It's no, like not even the beginning. Way, of and honestly, they, it, it didn't even, for all that hard work, it took them 10 seconds to go this in it. You right. know what I mean? So right. it's kind of crazy how it can be that quick. But I go down with the same kind of game plan that I had that I was going to the Bay with. Now I'm going to Vallejo to meet with Johnny Z, who is also another idol of mine. And you're still living in Chico? Still living in Chico. Go down to Vallejo for the weekend. He goes, you can stay at my house for a couple of days. So I show up with my records. He had a fire studio, downtown Vallejo. It's kind of in the hood, but 710 Marin Street. He was recording 40, Mac Dre, Richie Rich, the Loonies, the Louis, everybody that was Baby Bash. Pot and the Deuce was his other group. Who and Baby Bash was in Pot and the Deuce. Was, was Pot never around? Pac, I never. I mean, nah. he worked with all those guys. He, was out he in did. That area. Yeah, he was definitely there. I don't think he came through Vallejo and recorded, but Run DMC did because wow. Johnny was on profile and they were on profile. And um, essentially, I just walked into this incredible atmosphere of like some of the best creatives to ever do it. And I walked in and Johnny just pretty much helped me really craft out my sound. And I came in with the records. He helped me. I mean, I started learning the MPC and the board and we came up with two songs that weekend. And he's like, come back in two weeks. And so I just started coming back. And that was the, the, the beginning of my first group called the Dirty Rats. And I was MC Snipe and I was rapping in this voice. I started to go down there all the time. And that's really, that's really when I feel like I kind of went pro in some ways yeah. because my whole life was revolved around, you know, you're 20, maybe? No, I'm still in high school. Wow. Yeah, I was 17. And I was a junior in high school, but like on the weekends, I was going down to Vallejo and like E40 would be there, Mac Dre was there, and I would kind of just be helping around the studio, learning the ropes, and then squeezing it in. When, they would, when his sessions were over, I would just get on the MPC, the SB1200. And dude, I mean, Johnny just really, I mean, he mentored me, you know? That's... I had this group called the Dirty Rats and he was the producer and I was the artist and it was all kind of just these grimy, you know, really Cypress Hill metaphors, just so there's no rap, 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 but sing songy no hooks though. Okie blow records. No, yet. this is pre okay. that even. Okay. This is like, I'm still figuring it out. This is when I really want to just be a rapper. Like I was just on some, mm -hmm. like, just, I'm a rapper. And the response was actually really good. There was a manager, Art Gonzalez, who who also who was part of Johnny's camp. He was sort of the manager of Pot and a Deuce, who was who was the follow up to In Too Deep. Mm -hmm. He was sort of the manager of a lot of those crews. So he he started managing me. So now I had a manager in Vallejo. I have a producer in Vallejo, and I'm like at school, like trying to contain my excitement because all I could think about was I can't wait to go back down there this weekend yeah, and what's gonna imagine. happen this weekend and, and I was just like everything was so exciting I mean even it's at like the it's, you're like the only 
Well, it's like the first case where it's like a good idea to drop out of high school. <laughs> I know. Like, I, I mean, was, yeah, I, I'm kind of glad I just tuned yeah. out in some ways. But I remember this manager started sending my packages around and I was at school one day and my buddy AJ, who still does a lot of art, he goes, dude, you got written up in the bomb magazine. I go, what? He goes, did you see it? I'm like, no. The Bomb Magazine was like the coolest magazine in the Bay Area. And Billy Jam was a writer. It was like an underground magazine. And there was a blurb about me in there. Dirty Rats, new a demo from, I mean, new you know, yeah. mixtape from Johnny Z's, new artist, Dirty Rats from Chico. And I'm like, oh my God, I hadn't seen it. I'm in high school and they're like, yo, look at this. I'm like, oh, wow. So then I just was like, okay, okay, we can do this. And so actually the manager's like, yo, we're getting crazy response from, from labels and stuff. And I'm 17, and they're like, they want you on the Wake Up Show this weekend in San Francisco. So I'm like, what, what? bro? I go. On, Wait, what I'm records do you even have? I they're had. Not I was out, doing this they? dirt. No, they weren't even out back in the day. Though it was like that. It was underground. Yeah, yeah. It was like, here's the guy. We're gonna tell you about him tonight on the radio. Here's the guy. He's written up in this thing. Kind of like there that. was no internet of like here. I'm presenting. There was no even. It was like it you, couldn't be more opposite of that now. It's totally it's opposite. The exact yeah, backwards. I mean, you, it's like back then. It was like you kind of have to find out through these avenues, whether print publication, oh, radio it was publication, so much people talking. It was way cooler to be honest with you. <laughs> But it was like, you, you got to find out about these people. And dude, I went to the Wake Up Show when I was 17, which is still one of the biggest hip hop shows of all time, even currently right now, with Sway. Wait, that's not with Sway. Sway and Tech, yeah, dude. I was up at KML in, in San Francisco, living in Chico. And at this time, you had no, I had no even way to amplify that. I would just tell people, oh yeah, in Chico, I was just on the radio in San Francisco. It was a nationally syndicated show, but like there was no way to amplify that. It was just like you either heard it or you didn't. You know, you couldn't even like get a replay of it. Yeah. You know, no, yeah. So now, obviously, <laughs> you have that content and you blast it out to everybody. But then, well, who were you, were you on with Johnny Z? I was with Johnny Z, okay. the manager. I remember they drove me up there, and I was like all nervous. I'm like, I'm going up to some radio station in San Francisco. Motion Man was this crazy rapper he was there doing his crazy freestyles and they brought me on dude i was 17 and i start rapping and they're so you rap i rap dude i was rapping <laughs> with some on the best rap show in the history i was on there at 17 how'd you rapping. do i did good i was nervous as hell um i did good i did one of like my written freestyles at the time because i was just so nervous they played a couple of my records i had a song called down in the dumps and it was just about being a grimy you know just saying how you know we're grimy and we're from you know the gutters and all this it was just did sway did, did sway in, like ask you any questions yeah he was like where are you from i'm from yeah. chico i mean i was just i was so nervous and it was just all like this, a blur you know and so i come back and I'm like, yo, like, what's gonna happen here? And um, I, you know, my manager was like shopping the stuff, and it was kind of crazy because right around then, Eminem came out, so and this I ninety nine, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. and he was so fucking dope, and yeah. I started to listen to his stuff, and I'm like, yo, this guy is like on another planet, yeah. I'm gonna have to add a, another element to my music here because what I felt was I started to gather after about six more months after that, I was still kind of doing the same thing. My manager's like, yo, there's some of these labels are interested, but no one's pulling the trigger yet. We had American was maybe gonna offer a deal. I'm like, yo, I'm about to get a record deal. I thought that at the time, and, 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 and but it didn't happen. And I was kind of like, okay, what do I do? do now because I feel that I don't know that just rapping is going to be where I thrive like I yeah. I was singing <clears throat> I, all those Dirty Rat songs had those melodic hooks and stuff and I started to listen to Eminem and I'm like I don't really know that I want to be in so the wait, battle rap you scene. You must have heard like like Infinite Eminem like the before Eminem's first record because Oki, Oki Blow was like 97, 98. No, right? no, no, Oki Blow was 2001. Oh, it was. 20 years this year. Oh, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, okay, so okay. this is like okay. that. it was like 98 I think M came out and I was like, yo, I don't know. I, Cause even, even in the, the, I didn't really want to be like, back then it was like battle rapping and all this. And I kind of like, I wanted to make records. Like I didn't, I loved hip hop and I, I wanted to do that, but I'm also like, there's probably a ceiling for me on this right hmm. now. Cause I'm not going to be as good as Eminem. And now he's the standard of the white boy, you know? But again, it's like, you're like, it's just a good decision. Just like you needed to mix those records. Right yeah, at the beginning. I was now like, like, what eh. do I got to change up? Something, you know, we're close here, but something has got to give. And so I went to Johnny and I'm like, you know what, man? I think I like, I started listening to the Fugees a lot. And I'm like, yo, I think I want to try to add some like more melody. 
And I think I kind of want to like do something different than what we're doing with Dirty Rats. And Johnny being the guy he is, I go, dude, I just need a minute to like figure things out. So now I'm, now I'm 18, now I'm out of high school. It was kind of like I had the support group, but I really didn't know where to go next. And Johnny goes, borrow my SP 1200. He lets me borrow his SP 1200, take it back to my apartment on West First. And he's like, just make the craziest shit you can come up with. Just take you, all these records. And you had already been up. working with that machine? I had been working with that yeah. machine and it was like my it was like my bread and butter. It was yeah. it was like how I really learned how to manipulate samples, speed stuff up, tone it down. At this point I'm really getting into the craft of everything. Yeah. Aside from just I just You're make silly raps. I'm becoming a producer. Yeah. So I, I took a year basically with that machine and I just made like the illest music that I could. I was just just deconstructing samples, writing I was listening to Beck and the Fujis and Sublime and all this stuff and all that was just hitting me and in different ways and I was just I was listening to this uh, UK artist called Tricky who's like a trip hop artist and Portishead and I was like yo I just want to make a mashup of all this outcast all this yeah. shit and I just started putting together like bugged out songs and I would send them to Johnny he's like yo this is dope keep doing this keep doing this and I basically was like we came up with two or three records that were the initial like scapegoat wax songs mm -hmm. Love Tree a couple of other ones and um and I went back to Johnny's and I said, dude, let's just record this. And then we formed Scapegoat Wax after that. And then it got more like, okay, now we're kind of in alternative space. We're a little bit, you know. Had, had you, were you listening to hip hop and alternative like your whole life as a kid? I, you was, know, I, was it I, just I came rap? to a point where when I was younger, it was Hall and & Oates and Prince and Michael Jackson. <laughs> and then it became rap. And there was a time when, you know, some of the records I was doing in San Francisco, it was like, I'm rapping, nothing else. I hated every other yeah. music. There was a thing in in hip hop at first. It was like fuck R and B and the running yeah. man. It was like we didn't like any singing. It was just rap, rap, rap. <laughs> right. So I went through a phase where I hated everything except Public Enemy and NWA yeah. and Ghetto Boys, you know. But as I got a little older, I started realizing like, yo, actually, a lot of this uh, guitar music is really dope. Beck is dope as fuck. Beastie Boys. I mean, they were very influential in You're talking about being Jeff like, Beck or Beck Beck Beck, okay, Beck. Yeah. Odelay yeah. Beck yeah. Yeah. when he made Odelay. That was crazy to me. And even the Beasties, how they went from rapping, I grew up with them and then they went into, you know, sabotage and all that. And it was like, okay, there's there's kind of a cool space for me to explore here, blending the hip hop and all this other stuff. So that's what we did. And then Scapegoat Wax formed out of me and Johnny just, you know, him letting me kind of find my way. A lot of it was influenced by Chico, the first initial Scapegoat Wax, aisle 10, I was writing, I wrote it here and I was working all the best. and. I mean, essentially from high school, all the best is I started movies, working at all the best story. video. <laughs> I started working for the school district being kind of like a campus supervisor, but I was still had my music thing going. And that during those years, I was probably 18, 19, 20 is when I really locked in with Scapegoat Wax. And um, it's, dude, that's when it kind of really got serious. It's so interesting that almost everything you're describing doesn't exist anymore. I know, yeah, it's from, I'm from a different era. I'm Where, a caveman. <laughs> Jesus, I'm a how do you, you must think about, I mean, there's no way to answer this, but like, what, how do you think things would have been different for you if you had grown up in this Dude, era? I have no idea. I'm, I mean. Like, do you think that it would just, it would have been way harder? In some ways. I think ways, it would, in it, a way. It's like, it's, it's almost impossible to fathom because you're like, <laughs> yeah. I don't really, un, like now, I, I truly feel like unfrozen caveman lawyer when he's unfrozen <laughs> and he comes back and he's like, I'm just a caveman. <laughs> what do I know about all of this? Because, I mean, you would have been making records at like 11 in your room, I yeah, guess. Like, and then we would have been putting them on SoundCloud. And then... You would have evolved. I, There's like I would have evolved. the kid Leroy fucking yeah, was making records I at Yeah, but I just, 11. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. ugh, I really don't know, man. It's so different. Well, and there, there was a real advantage into how things work because it was like... There was gatekeepers. The, the grinder, more gatekeepers. There was gatekeepers. Yeah. And also the grinders really... I mean, obviously it still applies today, but... Just if you just putting in that work and kind of figuring out. No, it's definitely a more DIY type of thing, you know, where it's like you okay. labels aren't even unless you just are like some they walk in and they just see some star that they just have to give. You're yeah. still going to get kind of a crappy deal. Now they want to see like you do all this work on your own. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, you, which makes sense. Everybody's, you know, records are blowing up before they even get the button push on them. You know what right. I mean? So it's kind of a different it's totally so different. So in that approach. sense, it's a tiny. It was in that way. It was maybe a little easier for you in that you just you kind of got these opportunities before you yeah, really had to prove yourself. Yeah, in some ways, I almost think it was easier because there was like a, 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 a like a task, a goal. Now it's like it could come from TikTok, it could come from <laughs> yeah, Instagram, yeah. it could come from Facebook, it could come from. It's like 
there, it's the wild west so it could come from anywhere but there's it, there's like no yeah. focus you know so it, unless you you have to like really lock in on i'm going to focus on social media i'm going to focus on playing live Th back then it was like we're gonna get to the gatekeepers who are gonna like this or not or we'll we'll build up a buzz but it wasn't about like building our brand all crazy before we even present it right. which it is now right thanks for listening to self poor hope you're enjoying this episode with marty james you can find us on YouTube now. Just search Self Poor. We'll put up the full pods over there. No video yet, but uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Just audio for now. We're on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and Medium under All Swede Collection. That's A H L S W E D E. So, yeah, I, well, that's I, I got from high school. I took my GED and now I'm 18. I'm like working, but I was really, ho I was really, really focused on scapegoat wax. And we immediately got good responses from Johnny sending it out, Art, the manager sending it out. We got Jive Records immediately saying, we want to sign this. This is crazy. Nice. And so we started playing shows too because people wanted to see us live. Who, who's heading Jive at that time? This guy named Mike Nardone. The, the, Barry Weiss was, I think, the guy he's the god at jive he signed all these people this guy mike nardone wanted to sign us he had a big college radio show barry weiss passed but he, she handed us off, uh mike handed us off to a lawyer called Lori bula Lori really rode for us she's the one that kind of got us in grand royals view she's the one she's she helped grand us put the, the beastie boys beastie label, boys label yeah. that we ended up signing to but Dude, there's so many layers to this story. I feel like this is a 10-part no, episode. Yeah, no. It, yeah. It, it, so I was going to say, um, yeah, we'll segue into, this is a good time to kind of talk about the future. Now, yeah. we're going to skip a lot. We're going to skip a lot. <laughs> Which is yeah. great. That's great, yeah. though. Yeah. I mean, basically. I, I, I didn't know almost any of that yeah. stuff. So that so was the, the, awesome the, the very fast-forwarded version is we made Scapegoat Wax demos, and I don't want to leave out good vibe recordings because they are actually, yeah. they intercepted a package that Johnny Z sent to Big Beat. There was an A&R there called Matt Kahane, who's now known as Jack Splash, and he's dope. He heard it, and he's like, yo, we got a label that's part in Berkeley, part in LA. We want to put this out right now. They put it out, went to college radio. It made some noise. That's how the guy from the, the guy from Jive was hearing about it from Johnny. He's hearing about mm -hmm. it from college radio. Essentially, Good Vibe helped us get to a point where we could get it in front of more people. But Lori Bula came in, kicked the door in, got it to Gary Gersh, who was managing the Beastie Boys. There's so much in between all that yeah. story. But basically, we got signed by the Beastie Boys in 2000. And uh, Mike D was working with me all the time. And we released Oki Blow in 2001 on Grand Royal Virgin Records. So that was my right. first experience working with a cool indie label, Grand Royal, and then the parent company, Virgin, which they would walk me through. And, and so that took like, I guess like six years from when yeah, you started, seven years? exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, it was an awesome experience. You That's, know, 2001, Oki Blow drops. I remember I'm walking in downtown Chico. People are going crazy off the album. I mean, we're playing shows now, playing shows all over the state, packing shows all over the wait, state. Wait, what about Luxurious though? Luxurious was the Good Vibe record. Okay. No, exactly. So, That's oh, kind of, so yeah. what year mm -hmm. was Luxurious? That's what Luxurious I was, was 99. Okay, okay, uh -huh. okay. Luxurious came out in 99. by the way, a lot of the locals, that's still the, the that's still favorite the thing one that, that ever everybody, done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, we made Luxurious as sort of the bedroom project that, that mm -hmm. he had sent in to Big Beat. Part of that, Good Vibe jumps in. They help us put Luxurious out. Luxurious starts getting on a lot of people's radars through their help and, and us kind of working it too. And then Luxurious transforms into Oki Blow. And so then Jive basically is just like, we like this from Luxurious. Well, J and Jive, Jive oh, I'm actually sorry, Grand fell Royale. out. Grand, yeah. yeah. No, you know, they, yeah, they did do that to a point. I mean, um, the, the a r was like, we like these ones. You should work on these ones. I mean, they kind of let me do what I want, but they were like, the, okay. we think these could be the hits. He, Gary Gersh is like, we want to get Eric Valentine to produce Space to Share. You could hear the big difference from Space to Share on Luxurious to oh, the yeah. produced version, which is a big jump. But, um, you know, both of them, are, you know, the first one had a lot of soul. The second one it was very polished. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so it was so, a big so jump. So, it was so like decided. going from the minors to the, to the pros, like really mm -hmm. all of a sudden it was like, we were in with the Beastie Boys going from, I had, I had done, you know, 12 shows and now we're rocking with the Beastie Boys, you know? And this, yeah. And this is really when, like, I think all of us in town are like, now like, okay. now we're like your fans, you know yeah, what I'm We're no. like, just really like rooting for you hard. Like, uh. And just really watching the whole thing. I, you know? I, it's funny because I I um I feel that the the support that we were getting from Chico was kinda like 
given me the confidence that this is something worth doing. You know what I mean? Mm. Like I remember our first show we did with the band, it was like St. Patrick's Day, we opened for Oleander, and there was all these people there for us more than the headlining, and I'm like, yo, if we could suss this out, this could really be something dope. And so, yeah, I mean. Well, what a, what a perfect segue into, segue into what you're doing now and into the yeah. future. So uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna recap what the format of this podcast is supposed to be. Yeah. We, we, we got in your past some. Uh -huh. um, on the, on the light to dark wall, we have a uh, farmer's light brewing, Yum. which is a local brewery that I want to I want to take you out there. Okay, let's go. Um, they're doing very well. Twist my I'll take arm. Take a little sip. Marty's not drinking right sip now. Sip a sip. Yeah, it's I'm drinking a uh, cold brew, nitro. I think that's made by Max Minardi, who's someone who plays here quite. Oh, nice. This is um, good, Max. Uh, the middle wall, sweet and sour. That's where we just talked about the business, uh -huh. the music business. Now, like Marty said, that's a, a ten part podcast. That's a twenty part. But that was an awesome intro to to just yeah. to how you got into it. For that. We have uh, Ace Pineapple Cider. Ooh, you sure you don't want to try some of this? I do want to try that, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to mm. go ahead and pass. Mm. But maybe later. Ciders are... Uh, I do love pineapple. I love cider. So Ciders, kombucha are, are, are blowing up. Is that, is that that's doing good here? Two, yeah, two different styles. So that, that middle wall where you got like kind of non-beer options. I got to get more into the beer scene. I think I probably <laughs> well, will as I get older. I got um, you guys to help guide me. So now we're going to uh, hop forward. We have a hop forward wall right. with the hoppy beers. Um, I poured uh, Moxa Walking with Giants. Moxa's out of Rockland. They're my, probably my favorite brewery. Nice. And this is the first time they uh, teamed up with Sierra Nevada. So a little collab. Oh, collabs. We're all for the collabs. <laughs> um, now let's hop forward. Okay. Um, you're talking about how Chico kind of gave you that confidence and uh -huh. this kind of this home, this hub. Now, after... Dang, what, 20 years Yeah, of, 20, of 2000, writing? 2000, I moved to L.A. I moved to the Bay for two yeah. years. The Vallejo, get a whole scapegoat started. 2000, I moved to L.A. I moved to Silver Lake, and, and I, I lived down there. And now you finally decided to... Is This this is the first label that you've ever started? This is the started? first label that I've ever started, yeah. I've come to the point in my career now, having worked behind the scenes, having done my own projects on big labels, on small labels, indie labels... Um, learning sort of the ropes as an artist, then sort of learning the ropes as a producer, then working behind the scenes, writing for other people. And now I'm like ready to put all that, you know, forward into my own kind of vision. And, um, and you're kind of in it and it's coming, you could say it's kind of coming full circle back to where it's totally you're coming from. full circle yeah. because this is my home. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, one thing that, you know, in music that you can't replace is that organic, natural. People try to buy it. They try to fake it all <laughs> the time. But at my heart and soul, I'm a NorCal dude. I've always had, you know, one foot here, no matter where I've gone, all over the world, from L.A. to around the country to around the world. And I came to a point, I think almost kind of during quarantine, you know, I think it was kind of everybody's sort of figuring out like, OK, yeah. what do I want to do with my life? You know, I've had a I've had a cool run these last few years and I'm like what am I going to do with this space? Like, it doesn't feel like just writing songs and submitting them, sending them in, trying to sell them is necessarily all I want to do. Of course, I'm going to try to get big hit records and get songs cut and sold to a major label. And, but I feel that it is really important for artists to kind of take some ownership of their career in a way. A lot of times you're so reliant on other people to do everything for you. And I think now it's, 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 it's easier than ever to kind of have your own brand to sort of build what you're right. all about. And I think that any creative should have an avenue where, yeah, you're, you're, you're trying to make sales, you're trying to get out there and make connects, but you should also have your own thing that, you right. know, you own, that's yours. And that's where I wanted to go on over the, over quarantine. Um, I started just working on stuff and I started thinking, what do I want to do? My dream is always to have a label and always to have you know my own records some of them mine some of them other people i got close with this artist called martin that we were developing for a few years i learned a lot we got him a deal with warner who and who you who are you working with uh with martin with martin jr wrote him yeah yeah. yeah yeah we did it together and i learned a lot from that whole experience and i thought i want to even know more like i want to be hands-on with developing talent i want to be able to put out our own records and get it to a point where we the artist is valuable we have a whole system in place to kind of cultivate talent did you really did you really never have these feelings until recently well i always wanted to do it but i don't think it was i think i needed to kind of like you know, I, 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 I could see it, but I didn't really know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And now 
I feel that I've learned, I'm still learning on the job, but I, I, I kind of saw my career going this way. It's funny. My career is kind of going pretty much as I saw it. I kind of <laughs> knew even when I was on tour back in the day, I was like, yeah, I like being an artist, but I really feel like I'm, 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 I'm kind of a studio guy. Like the road is, is hard, it's grueling. You know, there's, you're, you're kind of a traveling party. There's a, lot, there's right. a lot of moving parts. The studio, I'm always about like being creative every day. What's next, what's new? And so the studio really affords you that luxury to just be able to do whatever you want, you know? And I always saw myself kind of moving into that space. And you also, I mean, you had, you still have so much songwriting to do too. It's like. Totally. I have always wanted a label. I'd always wanted to develop talent. And during quarantine, I started working closely with Reese and we started working on some more of his songs. And I really caught a groove with him on just being able to find the magic in his guitar playing and right. find some sweet spots in the melodies. His guitar playing lends really well to my melodic sensibilities. Yeah. I think. He was very influenced by Scapegoat. It's funny that that sound is very NorCal sound. It's kind oh, yeah. of country, it's kind of folky, so you're it's kind of hip hop. Yeah. Yeah, 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 he knows what I would like, what I would gravitate towards. And we started working on his EP. I started sneaking up here to record. And I started to kind of see a vision of like, you know what? Maybe this is, maybe this is what it is. Maybe, maybe we gotta create a new wave of this whole norcal sound Maybe well and we not just norcal but also like the eastern like basically everything that's not la and san yeah, francisco it's part of central valley right and i started to go you know what this area needs it needs a sound it needs a voice it needs some love and it needs some nurturing to help so we can help build an infrastructure here to like root other artists on norcal up here is not the bay it's not la this is a blue collar area that has its own style, its own sound, and you see how supportive of, of one another we are. Now with the internet, we don't have to just play, you know, you don't have to move to LA to have success anymore. Right. You don't have to move to New York City to have success anymore. So yeah, my, my thought is like, okay, we're in this state, it's the fifth largest uh -huh. economy in the world. It's the center of like the cultural universe, right? In Hollywood yeah. mm -hmm. or LA. Yet all this area that you're talking about is just like, eh. Yeah, like it just it's doesn't like, exist. Yeah, like, they're, they're, like it's just it. It makes so much sense to bring like a pop, and by pop I mean popular, yeah. like a pop culture to this area. Exactly. Um, and what, what was the, what was the expression you you you're riding with on the pop thing? Oh, a lake pop. <laughs> lake pop. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, we're we're gonna highlight legends from this area, legendary food. We're gonna highlight the hiking spots, the trails. We're gonna we want to put a pop culture face on NorCal. That's our main focus right yeah. now. We we hope to grow it. We hope to almost create a model of like, yo, right. if you can take this. I mean, most of America is small right. towns. We right. want, you know, this is, it, it's, 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 it, you know, NorCal is sort of our, our base, but we also want to communicate to all the small town people around the world or people from the smaller towns with big city dreams, people chasing their goals and, and basically, you know, encourage people to, to go find their voice and, and that you don't have to, you know, necessarily give up on what you believe or go somewhere that you don't love. You can stay home and you can, you can, you can build up your area and make it into something that is, you know, tangible and real. On that note, uh, it's, I mean, it's just coincidentally, that's like exactly what I was thinking about this podcast. It's like the guy, uh, uh, Skylar Bowles came in here a little while ago. He, um, he helped make spike ball really, oh, yeah, really yeah. popular. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, okay, you want to do a podcast? And then so I sat down and interviewed him and then just started thinking about like the exact same thoughts. Like there's a lot of interesting people that totally. could either come through here or from here, have some connection to here. Um, and so talked to Byron about it and like, I'll just produce this whole thing and start bringing people through. I think it's a great idea. And I then, yo, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here I, to collab. I feel like that, you know, now with the way that we can kind of see how the world is moving, yeah. I think there's definitely a lot more appeal. I mean, we couldn't even do this, you know, a few years ago. So it's like everyone's kind of coming into their own. I think that it's just overdue. This is a special area with a lot to give. And if you really, when you really look at the map, I'm like, yo, <laughs> that we should <laughs> be able of, to just go on tour all of NorCal and right. do four shows in a row and you're doing Red and Chico, you know, uh, somewhere in Marin, Mendocino, down to Merced, San Joaquin. There's, there's so many places that are, are, people aren't getting, you know, their art or their, their cultural fill. You, know? you, have, you have our unconditional support ditto, here at ditto. the Commons. Um, and I'm really excited. It's, it's an exciting time. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of new stuff happening. I mean, 
throughout this entire community, there's a lot of new stuff happening. I mean, we got the dope venues, we got the dope clothing, we got a lot of good things going on here. And Mighty Oak wants to, you know, be the sound to represent it. And we want to, like, welcome um, all the other creators from this region on board with us. Again, I see a ton of parallels between what Byron and Jesse and Garth yeah. did and you guys here inspired and what me. you're saying. Yeah, you yeah. know, you guys are entrepreneurs and have gotten after it. You guys are like my, my family, my brothers. And uh, the whole thing is it's all we're all, we're all going to work together and and i mean if i can provide the sonics the creativity the connections around you know la to the to, to the world already i'm seeing uh people that aren't from this area be very interested in yeah. this area because they're like oh this is kind of cool you're telling the story of of this other area that we're not we don't know about yet you so know? are you going to be like turning down features from san francisco and la people <laughs> like no you're not allowed on these records no, I'm, I'm not going to be turning down features <laughs> the idea here is to like bring you into the fold of yeah. what we got going right, on here right, right, right. not we are going to you it's like okay if we're going to have a right. feature then it's gotta it's gonna make sense we are gonna keep it pretty strict in the beginning just like we right. want to highlight norcal regions now we could do features from different people i'm gonna have paul wall on some records or grouch or whoever on on some stuff and and sort of put them in our world a little more than us going into their world you know and i think it i think it could be a really cool marriage you got to run yeah um, yeah we can pick uh we can pick up basically the bulk of your kind of successful uh yeah. music career on, on another on we'll another do pod. another one we'll do part two for sure yeah uh, uh anything that you want to plug mighty oak 530 on instagram uh the zero for oak martel james on instagram uh reese wiles uh new ep easy days comes out june 30th i have desolation out now i mean we're gonna be dropping a lot of projects don't skip over desolation desolation is a, is a banger desolation <laughs> is the song that's going to be the cornerstone for the whole project you know right. i i actually directed the little driving video and i really you know i've i had that song and i really wrote it about coming home and kind of I was going through some different stuff different breakups me kind of dealing with my alcohol issues and to be honest mm -hmm. that's a whole nother podcast <laughs> just you know dealing with just life stuff all these different emotions that this, song this, captures that yeah, feeling this song captures yeah. that feeling and I thought Steven Soderbergh directed that video yeah <laughs> yeah it was uh Spielberg you got the wrong Steven Desolation's out now just stay Spotify, tuned to Mighty Apple, Oak Spotify everything. iTunes Reese's album um, EP will be on there too and we're looking for new stuff so you know follow us send us stuff dm us tag us we'll share it we want to amplify the whole region so you know we need if you're out on one of them nature hikes and you want to you know get your pictures out there tag mighty oak and we will uh we'll repost you you know let's win all right so uh yeah you you, you added to your spanish lesson right see si, see si, si. yeah si. all right well, i'll see you at the uh, record release party tonight all right my man appreciate y'all <laughs>